Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We're going to study today. Today we have pulmonary anatomy and physiology review, along with some other fun stuff. So anybody out there getting their FNP degree in the nursing or just wants to study, let's dive right into this. Yeah, now I'm thinking how I can use a second screen. Wow. Uh, I mean, you can make it work, but what you're doing is you're basically taking a lot of the content on the smaller screen, dragging it over, and then kind of like, <clears throat> you can split the screen, you can put it in fours. I like to split this screen in half. I Really, I think it's easy to do this. With two screens, it's nice. Um, when you start doing three and four, it gets a little bit messy. So I can see how a second screen would be very helpful, but it's good. We're going to work with this. Sometimes you can, you know, less is more. You don't always need those big screens. It's like overkill. So, um, and you can always use the screen over on the laptop too. It's just that I'm kind of like focusing right here. I want everything to be really nicely set up. Let me know if you guys have any suggestions for that. What do you think? Second screen or is this adequate right here? What I probably could do is move. Just move it closer together. Let's use what we got. That'll work. Woo! Let's get some coffee in us. Really, when I brew this stuff in the morning, so I use like this mini Keurig. It just makes one cup. But then I have like a French press, and I put like about this much of extra fine grounds in there. So I pour the coffee that I've already made through the 
um, through the little K cups, the curups, the the yeah the K curry K cups. Why well, I really need this coffee? And I pour that coffee into the French press that already has my favorite, which is uh, Starbucks Verdana Blend Blonde, Light Blonde Roast. But it's it's really strong. Like if you let it sit there for a few minutes, and then you just like squeeze it, it's really good. I recommend Pete's Coffee. Anybody likes really good dark roast, I would get Pete's Coffee. I think they sell that at Panera or Major Dickinson's. That's a good one. Hmm. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. I'm torn between, I'm printing out these notes every week. I'm even printing out the, uh, the PowerPoint slides. And originally, originally I was gonna follow along the video and write down because I think there's a better, you have more of a connection. They say studies have said, indicated that you retain more stuff if you actually write this stuff down. But I'm finding, you know, I'm chopping trees. <laughs> I'm chopping trees down. I got this stuff. It's like I'm going from the PowerPoint slides on paper to the physical handout notes. And I would have to write it down. So I think I'm going to do this time, just this one time, I'm going to experiment with a different way, <clears throat> a different way is I'm going to have the handout notes on this screen right here. And I'm going to have the PowerPoints over here along with my background music. And this way I can just kind of type in and use this stuff. So this way I have it saved. I don't have to worry about carrying on papers because I've seen, I've seen medical students going, uh, <clears throat> saying that they had this thick book, books and books, and then they could just get a tablet. I mean, that's one way of doing it as well. You could get a tablet. I've tried the tablet. I just can't get used to like getting that, that pen and writing on that, that glass unless they've improved them. But um, just do what works for you guys. I mean, really old school, you know, new school. I would say integrate them both together. You know, I'm going to continue to print out these notes, but I'm going to try to start to shift a little bit because, you know, we, we need to change, you know, like we need to be a little flexible. And honestly, the way technology is, I think we everything is going online. My lecture notes are online right now for YouTube. Um, so I'm just going to follow along. I got the background music. I'm going to have these notes up here and let's just dive right into it. Oh, another thing I was going to say, when you watch these videos, here, I'll show you. the predominantly physiology and that of the four videos is going to be the heaviest and then there'll be two videos that uh, are the application of a so like intros like stuff that they want to fill in. i really believe like study your the core matter of everything you know there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on the outside part of it and i actually saw a video that someone produced and they said people study a lot of stuff and it's overwhelming if you can just compress everything into like a nutshell and, you know, just think of yourself as a squirrel going for that nut, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about all the leaves and the trees aren't just go straight for that core matter. I mean, once you've gotten that down, it be, might be good to actually go over and look at it a little bit to, um, 
be able to get a better understanding, but truly you're not going to have all the time in the world to read this book. I mean, this is, this, this is a nice book. I mean, I'm getting a lot. Oh, man, it feels good, man. I'm getting my, uh, my workout in. This book is got, let me see, like 1,600 pages. You know what I mean? But it's, it's good. I mean, this is a really excellent book. It's got good pictures and all. I'm not saying by all means use this, but, you know, you see what I'm getting at. You really got to um, compress this material because, you know, you're, you're just going to like, you're going to burn out. You know, you're going to have too much stuff to study. So you, you got to like find out what is the most important stuff and, you know, just like go for that. Normal or an understanding of normal anatomy and physiology to pulmonary function. Yeah, so I kind of fast forward a little bit the uh, the stuff in the beginning, you know, like when they're talking in the lecture. And then once I find they say something, this is important. This is, you know, this is good to know. This is important. Keywords like hint, hint, they'll, they'll tell you. And, you know, I kind of slow it down. I might have to rewind it. And then I can go to my notes and I can actually like put a little, I'm going to do this. I'm going to highlight stuff. I don't know if you guys can see. I just hide, I just highlighted something in there, right there. Oxyhemoglobin. I highlighted that important. So yeah, if that helps you, if not, you know, if, if you want to like, you know, sit there for, you know, you like to read, you know, that this is, I highly recommend this book. Pathophysiology by uh, McCants and Sue Huther, the biological basis for disease in adults and children. For all for all you aspiring nurse practitioners, this is the Bible. Like this is this is what you want to know. <laughs> if you know what's in here, man, you're gonna be good. You can take care of me. <laughs> Trust me. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, and you're not going to know everything, but just, you got to know, you got to know the basic stuff. Like I'm saying, I'm saying go for the core stuff, go for, you know, what, what is important build on that foundation. You know what I mean? Later on, you're going to get better. Then you can start to expand and learn other stuff. All right. Hopefully that was a good enough intro for you guys. So coffee, so important. Like I said, how I make this coffee. I must think it's like a Turkish coffee. You know, I got my little breakfast. I got my whole wheat toast with Philadelphia. I recommend this. If anybody is not able to get this, let me know. Philadelphia garden spread cream cheese. Man, it is vegetable, like vegetable cream cheese. It's got to be Philly brand though. It can't be... Can't be imitation, you know? Like, so shout out to my people in Philadelphia, if anybody out there is from Philly. Um, but apples, I love to eat these apples. These are the um, honey, either honey crisp or gala, I'm not sure. Honey crisp or gala, and your oranges for vitamin C, you know? I, I like to think if I just drink coffee and oranges i just get acidic so i have like some holy toast is always good to kind of soak that stuff up wow i could just like i like to talk you can tell i'm i'm really seriously procrastinating today so you know gotta read gotta read some books by jocko willink you know discipline all right so here we go it's going to be good, man. We're going to have a good study session. Refunction. So these are the global objectives that are uh, the pulmonary objectives across the board. So this would be what you need to be able to demonstrate knowledge of toward the very, or after you've completed all four of the videos. So we're going to talk through uh, renal, or excuse me, pulmonary gross anatomy, as well as multiple physiologic principles. We're going to talk about uh, the mechanism of control for ventilation, as well as uh, then apply multiple different disease states to that knowledge. The larger amount of time that you're going to spend. On so what they're doing is they're just going over the objectives. And Honestly, 
I'm not saying don't follow objectives. That's kind of like what they're required to, to teach. You know, they have to follow that for accreditation. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, a lot of times um, what's in the objectives is not what's being tested. This is, this is required by their program to get the accreditation that they have to go through and, you know, like we hit this, 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 and this. Yes, you're accredited as a school then. You, you, you have to follow that. Does everybody follow that? I, you know, I'm not so certain, but you know, you just gotta be flexible. Go with, go with what you think. This is in the IEP review and the disease information will go very, very quickly. So we're gonna start then with this first video being uh, essentially a review of the gross anatomy of the pulmonary system. I'm going to start. Yeah, she's pretty good. Like this, this instructor, I must say she is true to, to the outline. You know, I really like that they start off with an outline of the pulmonary system, you know, like basic definitions and everything like that. It's like building the foundations before you get into some crazy stuff. But uh, pulmonary can be tough, you know, I mean, but um, we can do this. You can do this. Start as uh, all good teachers do with a uh, essentially a listing of definitions. So when you look at the word or you hear the word oxyhemoglobin, I would challenge you to, uh, before I give you the definition, to actually think through and make sure that you have a good understanding of what oxyhemoglobin is. And oxyhemoglobin is that molecule that is formed when the oxygen molecule or the actually binds to the hemoglobin. See that? That's important. So there we go. I'm going to start to. Take the handout notes that were given, and I'm going to start to add to it. I'm going to tailor them. For that, you have a good understanding of what. And I'll slow that part down so I can listen. I wish there was like a quicker way of doing that, like toggle. If anybody knows of a quicker way to change the playback speed rather than clicking on that cog wheel, let me know because I have to go to that, and I want to really... I want to use that a lot. Like if I could put that like a little shortcut on my keyboard, it's like, oh, that's important. Like, you know, hit the keyboard and it slows it down. I mean, I have an old school keyboard. Um, it does have like fast for, I think this is for movies and stuff like that. Anyway, I got a new keyboard coming in. I'm all excited. I think it's coming in uh, tonight or tomorrow. I got a mechanical keyboard without the numbers. So it's going to have a little bit more. As you can see, I have a big desk, but it's not. I mean, I'll start to like conserve and be a minimalist with my real estate. Of what oxyhemoglobin is. And oxyhemoglobin is that molecule that is formed when the oxygen molecule or the actually binds to the hemoglobin on a red blood cell. We have a total of four hemoglobin binding sites on each red blood cell. So each individual red blood cell in our system, and we know that there are literally millions of them, has the capability of forming four oxyhemoglobin molecules. And while that is amazing that that can happen, and there's a lot of chemistry behind that, that enables this to happen, the really important piece to this molecule or is the actual binding of oxygen to the hemoglobin. We're going to spend some time in the physiology section to talk through the uh, change that happens based on changes in the metabolic rate where essentially that binding can either be um, very, very significant and tight or it can be very, very loose. So, for example, um, we're going to talk about this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And when your metabolic rate goes up and you're burning lots of ATP, demanding lots of oxygen, ATP. that bond ATP. of oxygen to hemoglobin. You guys are going to, that's going to get drilled in your head. ATP. So that that's essentially huge. what's taking place is the hemoglobin school. is literally throwing the oxygen at the cells which is exactly what we need to have happen. And then there are times when your metabolic rate is very, very low. And when your metabolism is low, you're not utilized. That's the other thing. I got background music. So what I'm trying to do, rather than edit these videos, because gosh, I, yesterday it was so 
it was it's time consuming you know like when you go in there and you try to edit these these videos and I used iMovie and I have a droid phone so I had to go in there and convert the convert the file over to um, to m dot mov extension and then you went in it just kept it crashed a few times on me and it, then it just I could swear it sounded like a jet engine was taking off in my on my computer like it was just the fans were running while the a 30 minute video was was trying to compress and you know I, I added all of that afterwards but what I'm trying to do now is just have the background music play and I'm trying to do this like basically like I don't know like grassroots like just very simplistic and try to just do, to, do this off the cuff I'm not gonna really edit too many videos because it, I just found like it just took up so much darn time, man. I mean, I think these, the people on YouTube, they must hire, they must have a team of editors and, and you know, I saw, there's one guy, oh, there's my, my first break is over. Gosh, I didn't even get started. Um, so I set it for like 20 minute intervals. You could set it for like 20, 30, 40. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, honestly. You know, Pomodoro technique, I, I talked about that briefly before. You're gonna just like take big chunks, like say you wanna study four hours, you study for 40 minutes, that's 10 sessions, you know what I mean? Like, you're gonna break it down and you're gonna have like some time in between. So, yeah, I don't know, like is that too much music in the background? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out. The volume, so I use Epidemic Sound. Epidemic Sound, it's like, you, you pay a subscription, I think it's 15 bucks a month. I think it's a little pricey. I, I think it should be more like 10. Um, but anyway, you're paying $15. If your videos ever become monetized, you get like a thousand subscribers. Like I have my nephew, shout out to Sweet Tie. Sweet, sweet, sweet tie. Look it up. He's got like a 1.5 million view. He's, he's got some great videos, man. I didn't even know he was like that. He's got like 950 subscribers. So he needs another 500 subscribers to reach that thousand before his, his video gets monetized. I mean, am I doing this to, for the hopes of it getting monetized? Not, no, but would it be nice? Yeah, it would be nice. It'd be cool. Like, you know, like five years down the road, so let's say they get monetized and then you have like background music. Guess what? You're, you're gonna, you're, I don't know, like what happens? Like somebody maybe can help me out there. You just go back in there and like edit the sound or something like that. Because I think with Epidemic, they said that it's whitelisted, that any videos that you had before, let's say you ended your subscription, you're, you're okay because you were paying for that. But, I don't know, still that gray area. I'm still I'm still not sure if I'm gonna keep it or not. I mean, this is what I'm using right now, Epidemic. That's the other thing. This is like, I'm in the beta stage. I'm in like 1.0, so really, anybody, you got any suggestions? I am, you know what I mean? I'm, I have a mind that's, that's attached to nothing, but open to everything, you know? And that's, Dwayne Dyer once said that, you know, like he, he was very, the guy was like, he lived in, Hawaii and he was very um, he was very much in the power of the mind and healing and stuff so I really think that that has a lot to do with it so gosh procrastination <laughs> I think the more you do it the that's the thing I think you want to eliminate like distractions around you so when I have recording with my phone recording with my phone right now but it's it's on like it's on silence, uh, you know, people could be texting me, calling me. I, I just got it on do not disturb. Um, and then here I don't have Facebook or anything open. The only thing I have is that background music. That's like, you know, in addition to that. And, and even that is a little bit, it's, I could feel like it's a little bit interrupting with this, but 
that's the max volume. And I can't get it to like lower. I don't know if it's. Gosh, it's so hard just to get that thing down to just like 2%. I wish they would have like a volume indicator. That's. Anybody have that? Anybody have epidemic sound? Let me know if, how you can lower that sound. Yeah, because that's the master volume, but then they have their volume. And then I'm trying to listen to my, my videos here for my lecture notes. So I want that background noise. I want that music from Epidemic. That's fine. But then I also want to hear the lecturer. Utilizing oxygen uh, on a large scale. So at night when you're sleeping, you don't need a lot of oxygen. And at that time, the bond between the hemoglobin and the oxygen is very, very tight. Uh, so that, that there's plenty of oxygen available when you wake up and jump in your car and start uh, riding off to work. So that's a very long way of defining a word for you, and that's just typical nobleism. So the next one on this list is something called PO2, so essentially the partial pressure of oxygen. And uh, again, I challenge you to think about the definition yourself right here. So pause the video if, if you need to do that to reinforce that. But this partial pressure of oxygen, this PO2, we know is essential. When you get a blood gas, that's the first thing you're going to be looking at. Because we as nurses know that if that PO2 is in the crapper, that the patient is on their way um, to not doing well at all. PO2 is actually a measure of that amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the plasma. So essentially what has to happen is the oxygen has to diffuse out of the alveoli through the interstitial space, through the wall of the capillary, um, and dissolve in the plasma, essentially become PO2, before it can then move from the plasma through the wall of the red blood cell and become oxyhemoglobin. So there's multiple steps to this PO2 happening. And you know this because there's lots of things that can go wrong with patients uh, that would cause their PO2 to be compromised. When you look at total oxygen content, that total amount of oxygen that we have in the human body at any one given time, the PO2 represents less than 5%. So that's 0 0.05 if you think about a decimal. It's negligible. But we know as nurses, again, if the PO2 is not adequate, the, you know, the patient's going to die, that it's absolutely essential. So a majority of our oxygen, 0.95, is in the form of oxyhemoglobin. We call it saturation, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Again, so PO2 is that amount of oxygen that's actually dissolved in the plasma. And when you look at the big picture, the total amount of oxygen, PO2 is negligible. It's less than 5%. But when we think about the way uh, our body functions, if you can't get the oxygen out of the alveolus and into dissolved into the plasma, if you can't produce PO2, you're going to have a dead. I'll be right back. I take a little bathroom break. Let's pause. Another very long-winded explanation. CO2 will be easier because we just had this wonderful discussion of PO2. When we talk about CO2, it's carbon dioxide. And remember that carbon dioxide is a byproduct of metabolism. Uh, as the cell begins its work, it's going to break down ATP. And CO2 is a byproduct of that work, that cellular work. So CO2... Uh, water, heat, 
and energy are released when ATP is broken down, when those individual phosphates are broken off. So CO2 is produced down ATP, and CO2 is a byproduct of that work, that cellular work. So CO2, uh, water, heat, and energy are released when ATP is broken down, when those individual phosphates are broken off. So CO2 is produced as the cell does its work. And if we have times when there's a lot of cellular work, such as a febrile state, or if I'm aerobically exercising, I'm producing a lot more CO2, my metabolic rate is elevated. We know that that CO2 literally has to be carried back to the alveoli, and it has to diffuse into the alveoli, and it, it needs to be excreted to be breathed out. Now, CO2 is not actually carried in a bound state. Instead, there's this amazing chemistry thing that happens. And I know as soon as you hear the word chemistry, you're, you're doing the yuck face. Um, because none of us like chemistry very much. Actually, I liked it a lot. I don't like chemistry. There. CO2 is actually carried back to Remember that video I told you? The want me to take chemistry? Lungs by the red blood cell in part. Oh, Essentially, part the red blood cell doesn't really bind to it. Instead, it does... You know what? I stand corrected. I had chemistry in high school. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't a... Um, I wasn't a science major when I got my bachelor's. In fact, I took geology. That was really cool. Anybody out there need to get a science, like a, a requisite done? Geology is so freaking awesome. Like there's so many theories about the Grand Canyon. We gotta write a paper about the Grand Canyon. How we think that that, that whole thing developed and it's amazing. I can't tell you what the answer was. Does this chemistry magic and literally kind of puts the CO2 into a backpack and carries the CO2 back up. It's a chemical backpack. And then in the lungs, it, it, it pulls that, that, chemi that CO2 out of that chemical backpack. It does a little more magic. And again, it then becomes CO2, it diffuses and is excreted. Now your body is able to carry much more CO2 than it can oxygen. CO2 is, is um, much easier to, um, because of this chemistry, be able to be carried. So CO2, um, there's a lot more of it in the bloodstream in different forms chemically. Uh, but it's the exact same thing. When we talk about the partial pressure of CO2, it's that amount of carbon dioxide that's in the blood. Saturation is next on the hit list, and we all know all about saturation. Um, I would... Why didn't you just say so in the first place? You know what I mean? Like that was, that was the answer right there. CO2, this is what I got after you listen to that whole, and please don't, don't, don't crush me on this because I really, this is my take on it. You know, like it was a, it was a very good detailed explanation of what CO2 is. Remember what I said, like get, get down to it. Like get down to what is, the most the core of the matter because if you're gonna study everything it's not gonna stick man you gotta know like you gotta break it down into little chunks you got key components like little things so everything that the instructor said is correct you know but the takeaway is that co2 is a byproduct of metabolism it's the breakdown of ATP CO2, you get that, so from the breakdown of ATP, you're going to get CO2, you're going to get water, heat, and energy. And they're released when the ATP is broken down. 
when you aerobically exercise, you get more CO2 as made. Uh, CO2 is carried back to the alveoli and essentially CO2 is the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. The other stuff, pathophysiology is, I tell you, it's great for really like, you really get in depth, you know, like you really get into depth with the, um, how do I explain it? When, when I do my assignments, they want to know, you know, they don't want to just know, okay, this person, they're, they have a, they're, the labs are showing high CO2 and they want to know what's the cellular rationale for why that happened. You have to break it down to a cellular level and you have to know this stuff on that. So that's why all this ATP stuff is very important. So anyway, that's what I got out of it. I got like two two key components out of that, that whole um, explanation of CO2. I would challenge you to, again, define this. Um, think about this. Put the, the slide on pause and, and actually think about it. The YouTube video, pause it. So what is saturation? Uh, I was actually a PACU nurse before there were... I'll look up the book definition of what is saturation. You know? And like I said, this is 1.0, so, I mean, there's always going to be room for improvement. Go to your glossary. Go to your glossary in the back. Oh, your, in oh, your index. Sorry. Glossary, this is like definitions. Go to your index. Look up saturation. Oh, here's another little... I don't want to say cheat sheet, but if you can get this book on a PDF format, what I would be doing right now is I would just simply type in, there's like a magnifying glass, you know, and on the right hand side, I could just type in saturation. Now, pros and cons of doing it that way, you're going to get every single word that saturation in, in the uh, in the text through the PDF format. So there's gonna be saturation every single where. It's gonna be like, even SAT is gonna be like lit up there. So, you know, you could use that route too. I mean, I did that a little bit, but I kind of like having the book here. So that's one reason having the book, you know, you just kind of like could go through it. You could write on it, you know, you could lift weights, use it as a doorstop. Saturation. And what, I'm not going to find it? Saturated fatty acids, and then after that it doesn't really, it doesn't say nothing. You need to go, let's see what the, the glossary says as far as saturation. Interesting. So my guess, it's not even back here. Saturation is not in the glossary. It's not in the index. So what I'm going to do now, that's what I'm saying. You got to find whatever method works for you. I mean, can I just Google that? Yeah. But I think we rely too heavily on Google WebMD. You got to get back to the basics and learning how to find stuff, research it in the textbook. You know, um, so I'm going to go to the meet, to the readings. You know, I have the, I have our syllabus here and I could just really rather than like listening to these videos, I can read the book. Some people just are good at reading and they retain stuff that way. So what happens if the computer goes down or you're somewhere you don't have internet access or something like that? Guess what? You're going to have to use this book. How many nurses have been at work and a computer system goes computer system goes down and they have to do everything by hand? I mean, it's going to happen. You know, your Dynamap's going to going to break. The electricity might go 
go off, the backup generators, you know, might not work, whatever, you're going to have to learn how to do blood pressure readings manually and stuff. The two-step method. So let's see, 1143 to 161. I wonder if it has anything in here about saturation. Hmm. Interesting. I'm sure it's in here, I just can't find it. I cannot find it. You know what? This is kind of like when you're you have to kind of like streamline things. You can't waste so much time on one thing. So that's what let's see what the instructor says. Pulse oximeters, yes, Florence and I worked very nicely side by side before pulse oximeters, uh, where we had patients that would come in from the operating room. And a good old sarcasm, man, we actually had to take out a stethoscope and listen Fast to their forward. breathing and count ventilatory rate to find out how well the patient was doing. So That's in today's cool. technology, we've gotten very, very uh, kind of complacent. Uh, you put a pulse oximeter on and don't worry about it as a system. And I'm going to challenge you to rethink that today. So what is a pulse oximeter? Essentially, a pulse oximeter was developed in the 1960s. Essentially, what it does is just like Girl Scout camp is what I think about, where I used to take a flashlight and, flop it and shine the light through my finger and I could actually project like a reddish color. So light is actually put, um, applied to a digit, and that light reflects back uh, based on the, the amount of oxygen that's bound to the hemoglobin. We know that blood that is highly saturated has lots of oxyhemoglobin, is bright red, and it really reflects light, believe it or not, fairly well. And uh, oxyhemoglobin, or um, red blood cells that have a low oxyhemoglobin, we know that they actually absorb the light. It's a darker kind of red blood cell and it, it doesn't bounce, it doesn't reflect, refract the light the same way, so. Wow, I never knew that. Did any of you guys ever, that's interesting. Yeah, let me just kind of like, I don't know, see that's, I don't want to say it's useless, but, and you might impress somebody, explain that to your, um, your patient care techs when they are out there doing vitals. Do you know how that works? Hey. So what is a pulse oximeter? Essentially, a pulse oximeter was developed in the 1960s. 1960s. Essentially, what it does is just like Girl Scout camp is what I think about, where I used to take a flashlight, and, a flashlight. Flop it and shine the light through my finger, and I could actually project like a reddish color. I don't see nothing. So light is actually put, um, applied to a digit, and that light reflects back uh based on the the amount of oxygen that's bound to the hemoglobin we know that blood that is highly saturated has lots of oxyhemoglobin is bright red and it really reflects light believe it or not fairly well so if the patient is saturating properly the hemoglobin blood cells are going to be bright red so when that um, when that light that you put on the, the finger to get the, 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 um, yeah, to get the saturation, the O2 saturation is shined through, basically what it's saying that if it's refracted back, then the blood is saturated very well with hemoglobin, um, and uh, oxyhemoglobin oxygen. or uh, red blood cells that have a low oxyhemoglobin, we know that they actually absorb the light. It's a darker kind of red blood cell, and it, it doesn't bounce, it doesn't reflect, refract the light the same. I would think darker would reflect, anyway. Okay, so, pulse oximeter is a little clothespin. We put it on the finger, it shines light through the finger, and then it measures that amount of light that's, re that's refracted or reflects back into the machine. And this is where it kind of went awry. In the 1960s, the scientists that discovered a, how to, to do pulse oximetry uh, was a chemical and mechanical engineer uh, who came up with this great idea for a technology. And in the, the seminal, the original article that describes this technology, uh, this author said that this is something that will never make its way into healthcare. 
Eh, I'm only 12 minutes into this video. And uh, I think I've been, this is like second round. All right, so this is how productive I am. This video. Because it takes approximately 60 to. I'm 12 minutes into the video, but um, 30 minutes into studying. So that means I, I want to say I've wasted 20 minutes somehow. I don't know what you call wasted, but I'm just trying to. Holy shit. This is all going to get edited out. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is horrible. Stop. Maybe 20 minutes. If 20 minute intervals are just too soon. I got to do like, you know what? Do 30 minute intervals. That means if you do two sessions, that's one hour. Yeah, do 30 minute intervals. 20 minutes too soon. So let's set that for 30 minutes. I'll tell you, man, learning curve, it's it's tough. Like trying to figure out, you know, get into, that's what I'm saying, got to get into studying now. Like it's so important to get into studying now and uh, just building good habits. Find a time of day when it's best to study for you. Optimally, I think your brain is more efficient, like in the morning when you wake up after you've caffeinated and you've exercised and all. Late, later on at night, I think I'm, I don't know. Some people can study at night. You know what I mean? Like I don't. I, I can't study at night, man. I. I, I just kind of shut down. So there we go. We're gonna do thirty-minute sessions now. To ninety seconds to do that calculation mathematically to take that light that's been refracted back and to actually measure. Um, how much of the four hemoglobin sites are bound or how many of them are bound, exactly what the saturation is. So obviously our technology took this idea and really ran with it, uh, minimizing the duration of time, the time lapse that there is in this measurement. And how did they do that? Well, they very nicely put the ability for an audible sound that follows the heart rate. And as a critical care nurse, it's very reassuring to have that. How many people think this is actually important? Is this, is this, is this good to know or a must know? I mean, yeah, it's, it's good to know this stuff. Like, oh, how does, does anybody know how that pulse oximeter works? Did you know it was invented back in 1960 by an engineer who thought that it would be useless and you know it counts the four uh the four sites where the the molecule is formed that it binds to the hemoglobin on the red blood cell there's four sites i mean i don't know that um ding 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 going in the background uh right along with the heart rate that makes me feel like it's a real-time measurement but we've all been in the situation where you have a patient who is was previously not breathing at all. I'm gonna shut up, because you know what? I really want to use my method where if they go into detail about something, I find it fascinating. That's that's the thing that I, I'm, have, I'm struggling with, the minutia of it. That's why for me, I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to just focus in on, you know, that nut, you know, I gotta look at myself. I'm a squirrel, I'm just going after that nut, you know what I mean? Like. Everything else is distraction. Focus in on stuff. And she said, this is important. This is, this is a must know, hint, hint. Go after that. Oh, and the pulse ox is doing 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. And you've already interacted with the patient and done whatever needed to be do, done, excuse me, to get that patient breathing again. You've already taken care of the problem. And now the patient's actually ventilating appropriately. And that's when you start to see the pulse oximeter drop. So again, um, we can have a patient that they decide to do an elective intubation on, and they give sedatives and paralytics um, and hyperoxygenate the patient. 
especially in the month of July when there are um, new residents available, let's say they begin to attempt to intubate. Well, the pulse ox is reading 100% pretty consistently, and they're about a minute into this intubation attempt. And that pulse ox is still doing 100, 100, 100, 100, maybe it's down to 98, whatever, and they're very reassured by this. The uh, nurse that's assisting with this is probably beginning to seize beside them because we know that, you know, a minute down the road is a pretty long time to be attempting to intubate. That's something you want to get in, get done, and, and have it be over with. So if that resident that's perhaps not as experienced con continues to attempt to intubate, time will continue to pass, and you're going to see that saturation actually plummet. But it's going to take that 60 to 90 seconds for that uh, pulse oximeter to begin to read. And again, it's giving us a picture of where the patient was 60 to 90 seconds ago. So we know I've already intervened because I'm not going to stand back and let that happen and maybe bag to the patient, giving the patient lots of oxygen to bring back up that saturation to improve that uh, situation physiologically so that the attempted intubation can happen again. So when you think about the pulse oximeter, I would challenge you the next time you're doing a pulse ox on a patient is to put that little stinker in place and then let time happen and to spend that extra time and observe the patient's ventilatory pattern and see if you can see these dips that happen after the problem has already been fixed. I would also challenge you to interact with your biomedical department if they come up to credential any machinery and ask them about the time delay. And the final point to this is um, neonatal pulse oximeters are the most expensive form of pulse oximeter that there is because we know that time is critical, especially in a newborn critically ill infant. And neonatal pulse oximeters run, they start about $40,000 because they give almost Holy real time shit, measurements. Holy $40,000. Um, and they, they have a huge technology piece that's built into well, the pulse oximeter. It's obviously very expensive. Moving on, hypoxia and hypoxemia. These two terms are used interchangeably, but for the purposes of our discussion, I want you to realize that they are very... Yeah, I think she knew that a lot of that stuff was just nice to know. Good, Good to know, not need to know. I don't even know what you said about saturation. What is it like? Paralytics um, and hyperoxygenate the patient. And this is where it kind of went awry. In the 1960s, the scientists that had discovered a, how to, to do pulse oximetry uh, was a chemical and mechanical engineer uh, who came up with this great idea for a technology. And in the, the seminal, the original article that describes this technology, uh, this author said that this is something that will never make its way into healthcare because it takes approximately 60 to 90 seconds to do that calculation mathematically, to take that light that's been refracted back and to actually measure um, how much of the four hemoglobin sites are bound or how many of them are bound, exactly what the saturation is. So obviously our technology took this idea and really ran with it, uh, minimizing the duration of time, the time lapse that there is in this measurement. And how do they do that? Well, they very nicely put the ability for an audible sound that follows the heart rate. And as a critical care nurse, it's very reassuring to have that um, ding, ding, ding going in the background, uh, right along with the heart rate that makes me feel like it's a real time measurement. But we've all been in a situation where you have a patient who is, was previously not breathing at all, and the pulse ox is doing 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, and you've already interacted with the patient and done whatever needed to be do, done, excuse me, to get that patient breathing again. You've already taken care of the problem. And now the patient's actually ventilating appropriately, and that's when you... when you start to see the pulse oximeter drop. So again, um, we can have a patient that had saturation actually plummet, but it's going to take that 60 to 90 seconds for that uh, pulse oximeter to begin to read. And again, it's giving us a picture of where the patient was 60 to 90 seconds ago. So we know I've already intervened because I'm not going to stand back and let that happen and maybe bag to the patient, giving the patient lots of oxygen to bring back up that saturation to improve that uh, situation physiologically so that the attempted intubation can happen again.
So when you think about the pulse oximeter, I would challenge you the next time you're doing a pulse ox on a patient is to put that little sticker in place and then let time happen. And to spend that extra time and observe the patient's ventilatory pattern and see if you can see these dips that happen after the problem has already been the pulse oximeter. It's obviously very expensive. Moving on, hypoxia and hypoxemia, these two terms are used interchangeably, but for the purposes of our discussion, I want you to realize that they are very, very different terms. So when you think about hypoxia, I want you to think about actual tissue ischemia. Um, hypoxia is a low amount of oxygen that is tissue-based, so I can be breathing perfectly normally and not have a low level of PO2. But if I'm having a massive MI and my myocardium is not receiving the oxygen that it needs, I can have tissue hypoxia that is myocardial-based that has nothing to do with 